thank you, Martin. Thank you very much for granting some of your precious time and uh, be with us tonight. I'm, 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 not, I'm, not, I'm not so sure about it's that precious. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> uh, <coughs> so uh, I have five questions that which are related to the advertisi advertising market, of course, and to the digital market as well to ask you. And uh, the first question is, could you please give us your appraisal of the advertising market globally? How is it doing this year? Uh, well, uh, well let, let's just define what we're talking about. I guess I, I would I divide it into two buckets. It's a, a trillion dollar industry. It's about 500 billion in traditional media, which uh, television uh, and, and print and radio uh, are the, the leading characters, print much less so. And there's another 500 billion in digital, uh, obviously dominated by the duopoly of Google and Facebook, which obviously is relevant to your audience. You're going to hear, I think, from uh, 10 British startups either before dinner or after dinner. Uh, and I'm sure there'll be a, an intriguing uh, intriguing uh, group of uh, startups. But having said that, we all know the digital market. We know in both Paris and in London uh, and elsewhere in France and the UK, the, the digital industry is dominated uh, by the big two and they have a, a very strong duopoly, 75% of worldwide digital uh, advertising is controlled by the, that duopoly. Uh, and digital is probably around 30% of the market currently. So they, they, between the two of them, have about 20% uh, of the total market uh, worldwide. So uh, I, I would divide into those two buckets. The, 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 the background is different to those two halves. The traditional half, we're, we're seeing pressure on traditional print. Uh, not so much on digital print, but monetizing digital print is very difficult. That's one thing. We're seeing pressure on linear TV. That's uh, traditional network television. There is a disconnect increasing between what, what consumer, how consumers spend their time and where the industry and agencies and clients uh, spend their money. And then the third big thing, I mean, so the first big thing is print is under pressure, traditional print. The second is not to as great a degree, linear TV is starting to feel a little bit of heat. But then the third thing is mobile, where there is this big disconnect where consumers are spending 25% of their time, and yet the industry is only probably spending about 15, 16%, if that, uh, on mobile. So. The big opportunity is clearly digital. The big opportunity within digital is mobile. Um, and I, I think that's the basic uh, background. Having said that, I would say generally conditions are tough. You've seen our competitors uh, report their, their first quarter. We'll be reporting our first quarter tonight and tomorrow. Uh, I, I think the basic background is quite difficult. I look at our top 20 clients. Uh, for the first quarter of this year, and whilst all of them have not reported, their volume growth is is negligible, dominated by packaged goods companies. Their volume growth is negligible. Pricing, maybe they get a little bit of pricing, but overall their growth in Q1 of this year is about 1%, organic growth. And last last quarter, last year, fourth quarter was about 2%. So the world is slow growth, uh, it's very little inflation, and therefore there's a focus on cost. And the investment, I, I regard what the people in, in, in the Hilton there do uh, and what we do as uh, value added uh, and, fo and an investment. Unfortunately, clients are increasingly benchmarking it and looking at it as a cost. Thank you very much for this information. How, how do you see the evolution of programmatic marketing? What uh, it's, it's continuously growing those few years, those last years. And uh, do you see a limit to this growth of programmatic marketing? And what market share uh, should it take compared to um, other, other advertising media? Well, well, I, 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 I 
our media portfolio is about $75 billion. That's the total value of what we, we invest in with our, with our clients. The, the largest uh, investment we made l last year in Medium was to Google and uh, at about five billion, just under five billion. Uh, then uh, the Murdoch Empire, uh, Sky Star, um, uh, Fox, News Corp, Wall Street Journal, etc., took about two and a quarter billion, and then Facebook about 1.7 billion. So, uh, of that 75 billion, about two billion is currently programmatic. So, it's still a very small market share. Uh, our programmatic tends to be focused uh, on the, let's call it the, 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 the short tail, the, not the long tail. If you look at a programmatic company like Criteo of French origins, for example, now largely based on the West Coast, uh, they, they are very much into the, the long tail, just like Google and Facebook are. Uh, but, but programmatic, you have said, is there any limit? I think the, the basic answer to that is no, uh, that, that data is increasingly going to inform what we do and what our clients do. The big question is how much of that data is going to be available uh, to our clients and to ourselves. So when we, when we see Unilever, which is our second largest client, buy Dollar Shave Club, that's not a way of competing uh, with Gillette which is part of Procter, uh, it's really about a channel of engagement and a channel of distribution. They buy whatever it is, three and a half million names, 70% uh, male, 30% female. And what they're trying to do is to control the data because the, the big, the elephant in the room, I think, is not so much Google and Facebook. The elephant in the room is really Amazon. And I, I was just reading an article uh, just the second, where Alexa uh, is now going to combine a camera into uh, its uh, into the speaker. So you will have Alexa in your home. We don't know how many people have have taken Alexa from Amazon or Google Echo, for that matter. But in addition to being able to speak to Alexa, you will be filmed. So. You know, if you're you're looking for clothing, uh, one can uh, assume that the artificial intelligence or the algorithms will be able to order you uh, clothing. You'll be able to try it on. It'll be able to see whether it's appropriate, like you do in the showroom of a of a bricks retailer, which you can do using digital technology. So, so the data that comes from that is is going to become critically important. And I think we know that Amazon are concerned about regulation in relation to privacy. Just that insertion of a camera, which is a very simple device, into a voice-activated device like Alexa raises all sorts of concerns. So I think the answer to your question is, I see unlimited uh, opportunities for programmatic the, the constraint is going to be privacy, and the constraint is going to be how many wall gardens they're going to be. The wall gardens at the moment are Apple, Facebook, Google, Alibaba, Tencent, Amazon, and the like. And it's our ability to get access to that data. And just finally, the issues around brand safety, which Google and Facebook have been facing uh, very strongly in the last few weeks, put this whole issue into sharp relief. And, and th this whole issue of control of data, privacy, become even more, more important. So getting this balanced, particularly in a duopolistic situation with Facebook and Google, and we, we're waiting for the EU, for the, uh, the DG of competition to opine on three Google cases at the moment. This is all really important stuff. Thank you very much. <clears throat> we have some large brands who, who are in the room, such as BNP Paribas or HSBC. And as you know, they are all afraid of seeing their markets stolen by startups. And uh, if you were the CEO of one of these large banks, 
Wha what would you do to prevent this? Well, I, I mean, far be it from me to advise, and you mentioned two, two clients of ours, uh, far be it from me to, to advise our clients. All I can say is that we do three things, to your point. One is we have established or legacy businesses that we're trying to drive into digital activity. So I said the market is a trillion dollars, half is traditional, let's call it half is new or digital. What we're trying to do is get our traditional brands, businesses, just like a financial services company like BNP or HSBC, to move uh, more and more into digital customer relationships, digital transformation, digital activities. So that's one thing. The second thing is if you're fortunate enough to have uh, brands or businesses which are digitally based, and digitally generated to push them to be more and more active in the digital space. So that's the second sort of strategy. And the third thing is really to experiment. Um, the, the problem with, with established businesses uh, is that they, they, they always refer to their history uh, quite rightly, which is very rich. In our case, you know, J. Walter Thompson has been around for a hundred and 51 years. Gray is celebrating this year its 100th uh, anniversary. So these are all brands with very strong cultures and history, but un unfortunately they don't move quick enough. The other thing is we run our businesses, you know, we, we focus at traditional businesses on revenue growth, margins, cash flow. Those are not necessarily the parameters that those 10 startups that you're going to look at uh, today, uh, tonight at, at, at the Hilton in London, uh, those 10 from Britain are not judged on the same criteria. So the third thing is to experiment. So we invest in Vice.com, we invest in full screen, in media rights capital that brought you House of Cards, uh, in Imag Imagina in Spain in terms of sports rights uh, and digital around that to invest in Imagine, which is Brian Grazer and Ron Howard's film company in terms of content. So I, I think it's to be vigorous uh, in experimenting because traditional companies tend to be pretty conservative. So push traditional companies, push your digital channels, and then lastly, uh, experiment. Invest, take minority investments, I think all this is, is really important because uh, businesses, particularly large businesses, are usually frightened to take risk. Uh, as you know, the, 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 the big issue now in Britain is the leave, the fact that Britain is going to leave the EU. Uh, how do you see the consequences for Br the British economy and for British businesses? And uh, in your opinion, is there a good way for, for Theresa May to manage this, uh, this leave from the EU? Well, I, 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 I'm, I'm biased, and you said, is there a good way? And I think my answer to that is no. Uh, I, I, if there was a, a less bad way, let me put it that way, it would be a, a soft Brexit, you know, a negotiated deal, maybe with a transition arrangement, arrangement free movement, etc. Uh, quickly. Uh, my, my fear is whatever happens in the election, and if I could be somewhat controversial, I, 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 and I don't know whether we're off the record or on the record, but here goes. Uh, uh, what I worry about in this coming election, or not worry about, is I think the Conservatives will win the election. That, that seems pretty clear, despite what the polls uh, have sometimes predicted in relation to other elections or referenda, they'll win. But I don't think they're going to win by as big a margin as perhaps some people think. I think the Lib Dems will do, Lib Liberal Democrats will do better than people uh, expect. Labour, I think, will have a very tough time. Uh, but I think what happens is that the Prime Minister gets a better mandate, not as good as I think maybe she thought she was going to get but what's uh, so she w she will have less people sort of stabbing her in the back which i think was the problem 
she'll know who's stabbing her in the front, if I can put it. But it's going to be a difficult, I think, uh, negotiation for the next year and a half, because it's only a year and a half, because it'll take six months for the 27 states to approve any deal that is negotiated. My, my view is we will have a, a pretty hard Brexit, that that will happen at the end of uh, the two years, maybe with a transitional period, we'll see. Uh, I still think the greatest likelihood is no deal, we'll see. And your own election in France, uh, the first round, whilst I, I would confess to being pleased that Macron uh, got through to the second round with uh, Marie Le Pen, uh, and I, I hope that Macron wins. Um, the things that it raises in my mind uh, are, he is uh, a Euro, a Europhile, and uh, obviously I, the negotiate, well not obviously, I think the negotiation is probably going to be more difficult with a, a, a stronger alliance between France and Germany, and on the assumption that Merkel uh, is, is re-elected again uh, with a, co a coalition in Germany, that means the negotiation with the Franco-German uh, alliance in Europe uh, will probably be more difficult. But that's, that's mere speculation. Thank you very much, Martin, and uh, have a nice Thank day you. in New York. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, thank you very much indeed, and enjoy the evening. Thank you.